All right, so this is the fourth lecture in my series. And today we're going to be sort of moving on uh, to higher dimensions. And to sort of, I mean, in some sense, uh, well, let, let's actually define uh, the prime and homomorphisms first. So the idea is we have G in a Bielian group. And we have our sum set A plus B living inside G. Uh, but like in other areas of mathematics, you have this notion of isomorphism. Like if two abelian groups can be equal to each other up to isomorphism or topological spaces, rings, fields, there are lots of notions that say that whatever structure you're studying, you just look at the maps to preserve the structure. And we can do that for some sets too. Right? We need to define sort of what it would mean to have a, a sort of a, a homomorphism between two different sum sets. So let's uh, define one. We're going to say if Ryman homomorphism, uh, let's say, is a map I'm going to call it psi going from A plus B into G prime, another abelian group. It's going to be defined by two, let's just call them coordinate maps. We'll call it psi A going from A into G prime, and psi B going from B to G prime. So that uh, we have this following psi of little a plus b equals psi of a of A plus psi of B of B for all A inside A, B inside B is well defined. All right, so basically, what, what does it mean? We have to have it being well defined. In, in other words, if A plus B equals A prime plus B prime, Well, then we have to have these values being the same. Psi of A plus Psi of B had better equal Psi A of A prime plus Psi B of B prime. Otherwise, this wouldn't be well defined, because this is only defined as this is a single element of A plus B. We need that condition over there. But as long as we have that condition, we can define this map uh, over here. And we're going to call this a Freiman homomorphism. So the idea is we have, you know, it's defined coordinate-wise, and we sort of get a map from the, the sum set to, so psi A of A plus psi B of B is the homomorphic image. And if it happens that psi is injective on the sum set, the whole sum set, then we're going to say that it's an isomorphism. It's going to be equivalent to more or less saying this is a if and only if statement over here. So that if we have the, these two are equal, that came from equal elements afterwards. Um, let's uh, see if we can uh, get rid of the, the coordinate maps and get down to a single map. So we've seen before in earlier lectures that we take a set and it's translate, they're basically the same set as far as it, in terms of some sets. So, and he said A and a translative A, they behave canonically as the other sets. So in, in proofs all throughout this area of additive combinatorics, you, you can translate A however you like normally for a sum set. It doesn't matter. It's sort of a, a canonically 
isomorphic copy of A. Same thing for B. So there's no real reason not to assume that 0 is in both inside A and B. Because we'll just choose our translates, the, the copies of A and B, so that, you know, zeros in A and B's inside B. Now we apply this, this homomorphism. We get a copy of uh, isomorphic sum that psi of A plus psi of B. Again, we can choose any translate we want inside the copy, and they'd still be isomorphic, because translates are basically identical sets as far as some sets are concerned. So why not choose a translate which wherever zero gets mapped to got mapped to zero? Same thing for B. We'll just assume that everything, both psi of A and psi of B, map 0 to 0. And this is a complete normalization hypothesis. Translates of sets are the completely identical with regards to some sets, so why not translate them so that we can attain this with the, the homomorphism? And now, let's see what happens. Consider some z inside the intersection of A intersect B. All right, then uh, we have 0 plus z equals z plus 0. That's inside A plus B, because z is in both A and B. So we should have. Psi A of 0 plus Psi B of Z being Psi A of Z plus Psi B of 0. But that just means that Psi A of 0 equals Psi B of Z equals Psi A of Z, because these two are both equal to 0. Right, so the maps have the same value anywhere they overlap. And that means we might as well, we should also note that uh, A is contained inside A plus B. B is contained inside A plus B. Right, by this assumption that 0 is inside both A and B. Right, so we really just have a single map psi that extends, it's this psi restricted to A. Psi and psi restricted to B is going to be B. We really only have a single map in this case. So if we do some normalization, we don't have to worry about these coordinate maps being all different, the subscripts and everything. We can just assume that we have a single map that is basically a homomorphism, right? What does a homomorphism do? It just says that psi of A plus B has to be psi of A plus psi of B. And psi of 0 has to map to 0. The only difference between this and a normal homomorphism is we don't need this to hold for every pair of elements inside the group. We only need this to hold for every pair of elements inside A cross B. All right, so it's not necessarily going to be a regular group homomorphism, because we, we don't require it to hold for all elements of the group, just those inside the Cartesian product A cross B. But once we have this notion that if we can sort of take an isomorphic copy, we'd, the behavior of the subset should be the same as in a the original copy. Like, for instance, you could take uh, an integer subset. Right? One, two, this is some subset A inside the integers. 
right? Maybe it's contained inside 0 to n. But now you could reduce it modulo p for a very large prime. because it won't matter whether we add modulo p or not modulo p, because if p is large enough, there will be, we'll never wrap around. You'll have the same addition, and being equal as an integer will be the same as being equal modulo p, as long as p is large. And so this would be an example of a Freiman uh, isomorphism. We would map here, just applying a, a whole regular homomorphism that just happens to be injective on side the set a plus b. So it's not injective on the entire group, but on a plus b it is, and so it's an isomorphism. By the way, we might, I might write something like a plus b isomorphic to a prime plus b prime. That just simply means there's an isomorphism between these two sum sets. But it's pretty standard in other areas of mathematics. We'll just extend it to the, this area of sum sets here. All right, so this is just the, the little introduction. Uh, the other part of this talk was about higher dimensions. So let's sort of talk about the dimension of a set or some set. And we're just going to focus on uh, torsion free So let's say we have a some set inside Z. Again, it's a finite and empty sum set living inside the integers. It's a torsion free group. Um, let's define the dimension for this set. I'll just translate so that zero's inside there. Doesn't affect anything. So we're going to find this dimension to be the largest integer d at least one in this case. So there's a Freiman isomorphism a prime plus b prime inside z to the d. Or we, we could, we, but we don't want to do a trivial one, right? Because we could always take this and just sort of embed it inside a one, you know, there's in higher z squared, there's a copy of z sitting there. I could just take this and plop it into a copy of z. That wouldn't really be telling us anything. So we want really something here that spans the, the subspace z to the d. So we could write this as a plus b prime minus a prime minus b prime generates everything. But if you translate it so it contains zero, it's just basically saying it generates the whole group. All right, so if we use this normalization assumption, assuming everything contains zero, then this condition over here it just means that our, our subgroup is, our sub, sum set is generating the entire space, z to the d. Uh, this, of course, should exist because we, we can't, this is a finite sum set. We're never going to be able to, a finite number of elements generate z to the d for an arbitrary large d. It's just going to run out by the, you know, trapped by the cardinality. So this number will definitely exist. And it's at least one because it lives inside z to start with. So we know there's, you know, one will work. 
but maybe we can do better. Now, there are ways to define the dimension of a sum set which is not lying inside a torsion free group. Sort of, a, but that's a, a little more involved. Uh, and you can, get, you can get a well defined notion of dimension that agrees with this one that's defined purely algebraically. Uh, but I'm not sure if we we'll really have time to talk too much about that. But the two notions will coincide, and you can talk about the dimension of an arbitrary sum set in any abelian group. And in the case that it happens to be, have an embedding inside a torsion free group, it'll agree with this definition here. Uh, now, let's mention this theorem here. So, we have our sum set lying inside Z. D is the maybe additive dimension, Freiman dimension of this uh, sum set. Say B has the smaller cardinality. We have a lower bound. It's at least A plus D times B minus D times D plus 1 all over 2. It's a result of Ruja. Uh, extending a result earlier, Freiman with the case A equals B. So let's take a look at this bound. So if d equals 1, what does this correspond to? We get a plus b being at least a plus b. And then that looks to be uh, minus 1 over there. 1 times 2 divided by 2, that's minus 1. That's that lower bound we got the very first lecture for torsion-free groups. It always holds. This is actually just an extension of that. d equals 2. a plus b. That's at least a plus 2b. And let's see, 2 divided by 2, that cancels out minus 3. Look at that. That's that bound we got from the Freiman 3k minus 4 theorem. If we were below this bound, things were contained inside a one-dimensional arithmetic progression. Of course, that would prevent this from being two-dimensional. Because you, you would be, even if you had a higher dimensional space, it would be trapped inside that arithmetic progression. D equals 3. This is a plus 3b minus 6, and so on. And you can see we're sort of getting new and higher thresholds each time. There's sort of like a change in potential behavior as we go up uh, little by little, where you can get uh, higher dimensional sum sets. You might remember Freiman's theorem. So you could approximate uh, a small sum set, a plus a, by a multidimensional progression. You can use the dimension of the set for the progression. And it's never more than more or less where you have an upper bound for it based upon this inequality here. It can't be too large. If the dimension is very large, the sum set's going to have doubling constant roughly d plus 1. And so you, the dimension is bounded. And that, that bound is actually tight. Right, this can be achieved. Uh, there are lots of ways to achieve this bound. We've, we saw one in the d equals 2 case yesterday. So there's, these are sort of threshold levels. And we've sort of studied a little bit in this lecture series what happened at the, the first threshold and the second threshold. And uh, getting to higher thresholds is really only known if we go with the Freiman's theorem itself, where things are much more approximate. Uh, so we're going to focus in this lecture sort of below that threshold d equals 3. So we're sort of between, in this range here, we're not, we're not above the threshold d, so we, we only have one or two dimensional behavior. So let's focus on two-dimensional sets. Right, so uh, there, there is nice uh, behavior between lower-dimensional sum sets. This is somewhat different than higher-dimensional sum sets. As is often the case in other areas of mathematics. Uh, so there are some slight differences. But we'll focus over here. Um, let's, 
let's introduce a notion of uh, compression. This is something that's very typical uh, from finite geometers in various forms, uh, but it also can, tends to be useful for, for some sets too. So. All right, so you can do this with in many different lines, but let's more or less assume we're compressing orthogonally. This isn't really necessary, but we're going to maybe let, you know, we have Z2, right? It, this is uh, all our ordered pairs, x, y. So maybe we have E1, that's 1, 0, and E2. 0, 1, these are our standard basis elements, say, for Z2. I mean, there are other basis elements, but there's a standard pair there. Let's use this pair over here for doing what I'm going to say, although it doesn't really matter. We could use really any pair of elements. All right, so we have our sum set inside Z squared. And let's decompose A and B in terms of the horizontal lines. All right, where each A alpha is going to be all the elements contained inside a, a separate horizontal line. Well, let's just say this is intersect A. All right, so. We're just taking, this is a line parallel to the x-axis, right? If we didn't have a zero there, we're just on the x-axis. And we're sort of translating it up and down by some alpha. This is some sort of y-coordinate. And we'll assume maybe y is on the x-axis. And we're just slicing our set by this horizontal line. And we're seeing, well, these are the elements a alpha, all that line, this line parallel to the, the x-axis, the one that passes through the point alpha. And we have various ones that we're assuming they're all non-empty. And these are our slices, all the, the lines that pass through the horizontal lines that intersect our set A. We do the same thing for B. All right, so each B beta is going to be the intersection to B with a horizontal line that hits it non trivially. In fact, uh, maybe I'll make this x alpha, yeah. Let's make these x's and these y's. So let's look at the, the sums at a plus b. This is basically all everything in the form x plus alpha, y plus beta, as we range over all, say, alpha inside i, beta inside j. And we can sort of uh, partition this. All right, these are And some of these are going to lie on the same line. So just imagine that we have two lines here. They, when you add them together, this lies on the same line that passes through the point alpha plus beta. All right, so it's also contained inside a single horizontal line, just passes through a different point, alpha plus beta. All right, so there are lots of these pairs that might add up and lie to the single, the single line over here. So maybe we'll just index, we'll write this as Z gamma, gamma inside K, where these ones being all the slices right, 
we do this, then the Z alphas are just the unions of all the X alpha, Y alphas that sort of line up in the proper line. So I equals this, but this is modulo the, the vertical line. So it's just, we can, if we assume all the alpha, beta, and gammas are lying on side uh, the, the vertical line, then this is the case. But we only have this basically modulo. Well, just imagine assuming here that alpha, beta, and gamma are all on the line that passes through E2. All right, so we have the canonical representations over here. So we're going to try and estimate the sum set A plus B is the disjoint union well so we'd say all these gammas inside K all right because these are all disjoint lines as we run over all the possibilities And each one of these z's, we could do like we did the, with that special case yesterday, is, it's a union of these sets. It's at least the maximum one inside the element there. So this is at least uh, some overall possible lines that intersect our sum set. The maximum size of these two elements, like so. And now these are discrete sets lying inside a line as a torsion free group. We have this Cauchy Davenport bound for Z. This is at least X alpha plus Y beta minus one overall alpha plus beta equaling gamma. So now we're going to do a very similar thing that we did yesterday. We want to basically replace each of the, these slices, these by horizontal lines, X alpha and Y betas with uh, sets that sort of uh, are nice. We're basically going to compress these sets, right? Let's replace X alpha and Y beta with arithmetic progressions that start off, say, on the, the vertical line, the X and Y axis, and just have the same number of elements as X alpha and Y beta do, difference being the, the generator E1. All right, because we know arithmetic progressions minimize the sum set. And if we do that, it doesn't matter. It will it'll globally minimize every pair at the same time. That's the, the sort of the nice thing we have. If, if this is an arithmetic progression with difference one and, and y beta is different with arithmetic progression with difference one, then it will minimize all these pairs at the same time. We don't have to worry about the, the pair for x1 and y1 being minimized there, but x1 and y2, it, that doesn't work for that pair there. They don't minimize. We can minimize them all simultaneously. Let's just let this be the, an arithmetic progression. With difference E1, first term on the vertical axis. And the same number of terms as X alpha. Likewise for All right, so we're just going to take our points and we're going to compress them. Right, we might have had originally our, our slice might have sort of looked like so there's the y axis and here's our one of our slices. Maybe this is our, our x alpha over here. It's on a horizontal line. There's some gaps over here. Here's this is supposed to represent the vertical axis. After we apply this, we're going to instead have the remove the gaps. 
Right, we have one, two, three, four elements, and it's going to start on the y-axis over here. All right, so we're mapping this set over here with lots of gaps, not even start ne necessarily starting on the y-axis to this set over here. Same number of elements. They're now in arithmetic progression, and they all start at this canonical place along the vertical axis. That's all we're doing for every x alpha, every y beta. We're just compressing the set and shifting it to make sure everything lines up properly. Now, if we do this, let's define a new set. Uh, it's called x prime, a prime, and b prime. When we add these together, well, we could do the same argument over here, except we're going to have equality at every step, right? Because they're lined up, so these are an arithmetic progression. So they all x alpha plus y beta. This is an arithmetic progression as a term starting at the zero point, and whatever other one we might have multiple elements that sort of map here, but another one that maps to the same place is going to also start at the same place and be an arithmetic progression. Maybe it has more terms or less terms, but they're, we're never, they're all going to overlap. And so this step over here is going to be inequality because of this alignment, because each, terms, each one of them starts at the same spot, and they're all arithmetic progressions. If you have a bunch of arithmetic progressions with the same difference starting at the same term, well, the union, the size of the union is just the size of the largest arithmetic progression. We're just using that basic fact. So this will be inequality for our prime sets. And since there are arithmetic progressions, this will also be an equality. And this, because we have the same cardinality, is going to equal this set right over here. So the short and the long of it is this equals that set right there. All right, we can compress our sets, re remove the holes in the horizontal lines, get a new sum set covered by the same number of vertical lines whose sum set is smaller. Because all these, this has the same exact value as this, and for it, all the, every, the, all the equalities hold. So this is useful because we can sort of, uh, you know, the, the arbitrary set can have strange, irregular behavior. When we compress it along a vertical or horizontal line, whatever line we want, we get a set that's more regular and has smaller sum set. So that if A plus B had small sum set, well, then so does A prime plus B prime. Now, we can do this both vertically and horizontally. In fact, we can even compress horizontally and then vertically. And we're still going to have this equality over here, because this works for any compression. We, we didn't really matter that it was a horizontal line. We could have chosen any line, as long as we have two pairs of lines for reference. So let's maybe see what might happen over here. We, we might have a general set that sort of looks a little funky to begin with. Right, maybe this is what our set A looked like to begin with. Let's uh, compress this horizontally. We compress this horizontally. Well, we see we have one, two, three, five points at the top, followed by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then we have three. Let's actually make this one to be a gap where there's nothing there. And we have nothing over here. And then a single point over there. All right, so that's horizontal compression. Now let's vertically compress this. All right, 
we're going to just compress everything vertically. So these elements are going to sort of map up here. This element is going to map here. We're going to have something 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 1. All right. There's an example of what's going to result afterwards. And you can see that now the, the vertical lines are all in arithmetic progression by, by definition. So before there were some gaps. Over here there was a line missing. There could be more lines missing. But once we compress vertically, all our vert horizontal lines lie inside the same arithmetic progression. And in fact, the sizes of them go down monotonically. Right? The, the first line is going to have the most elements, the second one the second most, and so on. So we have a nice canonical form for our sum set. And by this short little calculation, we know that if we horizontally and vertically compress, the size of the sum set only went down. It can't have increased. So if we know our original sum set was small, so is the compressed set. And conversely, if we can show that the compressed set is large, we can show that the original sum set is large too. So let's state a theorem along these lines. So we're inside z squared. I'm going to let m be the number of uh, horizontal lines that intersect a. We're going to let n be the number of horizontal lines that intersect B. The conclusion is the size of A plus B is at least bound, this bound here, A over M plus B over N minus 1 times M plus N minus 1. All right, so the average number of points per line are summed up, minus 1, Cauchy Davenport style times the total number of lines if we compressed. Right, and we can see when we did this compression, when we first compress horizontally, we don't change the number of horizontal lines that intersect A. We're just changing where the points are distributed. And since after we do a horizontal compression, along the vertical axis, there's an entire, you know, we have this line over here. There's one element from every line that intersects a horizontal line, because they all start on the same vertical line. When we horizontal, horiz vertically compress, we're not going to lose any line, any horizontal line. So when we horizontally compress followed by a vertical compression, those parameters M and N don't change for the sets. So we can assume without loss of generality for proving this theorem that our sets are compressed in such a fashion. We can assume they're compressed. So A is a union maybe from I equals 1 to M of AI, and B equals the union from J equals 1 to N of BJ. Uh, let's call the nexus to be 
consistent and wise. And A plus B is going to be the union from K equals 2 to M plus M of all the, well, Xi plus, I just write down as a cardinality. So as we've said before, it's just the maximum of all these when they all have this, so it has this size over here. So all that's really left is to sort of do a, a basic minimization problem. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's a little bit of a tricky one. And I think I may skip the details. The, the, the argument is it's fairly short, but um, the compressed set has, has, has equality. So yeah, for the compressed set, it has equality. For the original set, it would just only be an e inequality. So once we assume that we started with them being compressed, that it becomes equality. So, so I actually just set it equal to the compressed sets. But for the original set, that's, it's only a lower bound, yes. All right, so really all that's left to do is to prove this little lemma, which I'm going to skip the calculations, but let me write it over here. For a vector, let's just say z1 up to zk inside real numbers, let's define z bar just to be the average of the coordinates. There are k coordinates, so we'll just add them up and divide by k. And if we have two such vectors, Say x1 up to xm, y from y1 up to yn. Let's define this funky function u of x, y. To be the sum from all k equals 2 to m plus 2, the max of all xi plus yj i plus j equaling k. Right, so it mirrors exactly this, this bound over here. Minus, the minus 1 is missing, but that's a fixed term. This is, if we remove the minus 1 over here, this is just minus m plus n minus 1, right? So we, that's a fixed constant because we know how many lines there are. So we just really need to minimize this quantity over here. This is the exact setup we have. We just need to show Let's see. U of x times y is at least m plus n minus 1 times x bar plus y bar, like so. All right, if we can do this, we apply it over here, and we would get the desired bound, and everything would follow pretty readily. Now, I could finish this proof in the next 15 minutes. But then we wouldn't, it's, it's a very it's a simple, it's a tricky calculation, but it's a very simple one. Uh, when we first proved this, I came up with a much more complicated proof for this result, and Uriel Serra came up with this much cleverer, shorter proof that was much nicer. Um, so it, it, you can do this by induction, and if you write everything nice and neatly, it, it all comes out. Um, I don't think there's much to be learned from doing that induction, so I'm going to skip the details here so that I can talk about another application instead. Uh, but the idea is that we, once we have this bound, we have something that looks this form over here. And this, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the, the, the broom minkowski theorem. Uh, this is actually a generalization of the broom minkowski theorem for two dimensions. I know the bound looks a lot different than it does for the broom minkowski theorem, if you're familiar with that bound over there, but it's actually stronger than that in two dimensions. 
Now there's some unfortunate behaviors over here because, well, more or less as M and M are getting larger, this bound gets bigger, sort of. Unless they get too large that they start to be on order of A and B, and then it starts to get smaller again because then you, you have the opposite behavior happening. But as long as A and B are large enough with respect to M and N, then having larger M and Ns increases the size of the sum set by this bound over here. It's, uh, you have to do some little analysis to see how this all works. But that, that's what's basically happening with this function over here. And so it says if you want to have small sums that you need to be covered by a small number of parallel lines. So there has to be some direction. Uh, so you know, the number of parallel lines that say the intersect A has to be small. And you can make this precise, can actually prove results like this, you know, not having to worry about A being too large, getting a threshold. Like say you know that um, A and B, B are both covered by at most S lines. As long as A and B are, say, quadratic in S, you get a bound of this form over here. This take, takes a little doing. You can do this, but you can sort of fight the, the, the tendency for when M and M get too large close to this A and B and show that that doesn't matter. Uh, basically, when you have them very large, the only way for equality really to hold is if they're, they're so short that vertically you get you know, a smaller number of lines. All right, if you're going to start getting into the realm where this starts to be in, very small, you're going to have all your, your slices are going to have very small numbers on them. And when you compress, which you would need to for equality to hold, I mean, at least you theoretically would assume that would be the case. You, to prove that is not uh, immediate. Then all the vertical lines are smaller in number. And then you just use the vertical lines instead of horizontal lines. And so even if the vertical lines don't work, the horizontal lines work. And in some line direction, everything works out. But of course, that's only informal because we're working with compressed sets. And there's a lot of details that have to be worked out to make sure that that actually works in general. In the remaining time, I want to talk about linking something that links the previous lecture with this one. So you might remember we had this 3k minus 4 theorem. We're now back in z. A and B, A is the larger cardinality set. And we have our bound. This is A plus B plus R at most A plus 2B minus, uh, let's just say 4. Remember, there was a minus 3 minus delta, but I'll, we'll keep it simple today. All right, so there exist these progressions such that A is contained inside PA. B is contained inside PB, and the difference has not too many elements missing, bounded in terms of this parameter R. And for every one we're above the trivial bound, we get one extra element missing, one extra hole. All right. And these bounds are tight. Remember, we showed, uh, gave an example, at least in the case when A equals B, but there are examples for when A is a, when B are slightly different, that, that show that you couldn't do better than this. Remember, we had the, in, in that example we had that showed you couldn't go beyond this 3 minus 4, 3K minus 4 bound, was basically the union of two arithmetic progressions. And if you think about it, two arithmetic progressions that were disjoint, that's really two parallel lines. All right, so we had the, this set, the, the, it was the counter example sort of look like this, and these were all disjoint. This is isomorphic with A prime just being inside Z2, consisting of two things on two horizontal lines. This is the A1 prime, the image, and here's the image of A2 prime. Well, there could be some holes here and some gaps, but you, you can write down the prime and homomorphism. It's basically this set over here. So that those counterexamples are coming from higher dimensional examples. They're coming from things in Z2, where the sums at A plus B is actually two dimensional, not one dimensional. And that's why the theorem breaks down, because you're looking at the wrong group. It's not the canonical embedding for the, the sums that it's uh, just a, a lower dimensional embedding from a higher dimensional space. And you, it would really make more sense to view the sum set in a more, in its higher dimensional space where the, the behavior is more regular. When a sum set sort of lives in its maximal dimensional group in its, it can't do as weird of things as it can in lower dimensions. Um, 
So this is basically saying the only reason this breaks down is because we hit this two-dimensional threshold, and we should have been looking at two-dimensional progressions instead of one-dimensional progressions. And while this is all tight, at least assuming you want to bound both A and B by short lengthening out the progressions, I thought I mentioned a fairly new result, because we've seen a lot more classical ones, uh, that sort of improves on this for a much lower bound. So let me write down the, the bound here. Here's a something that's much newer. So again, they're finite and non-empty. We're going to assume that B is at least 3. This is not much of an assumption, because if you add a, a, a to a set of cardinality 2, well, it's, you basically just look at the decompose, you know, if b would more or less be 0, 1, you would just decompose a into intervals of length 0, 1, you get one element added for each interval. So we'd just be saying that, that there's not much going on. So there's not much loss in assuming b is at least 3, because the structure of a plus a cardinality 2 set is pretty simple. So let's let s greater than or equal 1 be the integer such that this holds. S minus 1 times S times B over 2 minus 1 plus S minus 1 is strictly less than A. And this is S times S plus 1. All right, so basically we, we have the same function here. We plug in this S minus 1 plus S. We have the same quantity, s minus 1 here. We have the same function over here, just with one increment more. So this one here matches the lower bound here. So there's, in sense, this is a, a positive number, where there's going to be a unique s that makes this true inside the given range. So we just find the one that actually makes this true. You can solve for it to see roughly what it's equal to, get estimates afterwards. We're going to assume that the sum set is a plus b plus r. And now let's assume that it's at most a over s plus b over 2 minus 1 times s plus 1. Right, you might notice it looks very similar to this bound over here, except n is just equal to s taken to be s, uh, m is taken to be s, and n is taken equal to be 2. Well, that means there exists an arithmetic progression PB such that B is inside PB and there aren't that many holes, R plus 1. Right. So we can't get both sets contained inside a short arithmetic progression because we're above this threshold. This number in general is going to be bigger than A plus 2B minus 4 because we've like I said, this one this gets slightly bigger and bigger as we're increasing the size of the, the m. So this, this bound is getting bigger over there. So we're above the threshold where this theorem shouldn't hold. We can't get both of them contained inside short length arithmetic progressions. But if it's, we're only looking for the shorter set, the smaller set cardinality b to be contained inside an arithmetic progression, that still happens up to that bound. If you're wondering where that bound came, comes from, well, it's a minimization question. Right, if you look at this bound and you assume that n is at least 2, and you have some relative and some assumptions of the sizes of a and b, you'll see that that is the s that minimizes this bound over here. So what we're basically saying is that, well, if we can show and how the more or less the proof works is it's, it's going to be, the proof is very similar to the proof that what have we done from last, uh, the last lecture with the modular reduction. You have your set a and b and you, you reduce modulo So here's A and here's B. Maybe B is contained everything in 0 to N. And you can use modular reduction modulo N. You'd get some set B1 and some set B2, which is just this element 0. Right, but A doesn't have any restrictions of the diameter. We don't know. It, it could be a huge set 
So there'll be lots of sets. When we did the modular reduction, the yesterday's lecture, and then we used A and we had B, B was, there were only two non-empty sets. Either there was just A naught, and that was just all of A, and if at worst, when we got to A2, we only had a single element zero. There weren't a third set or a fourth set, fourth set, because we took the end to be the larger diameter. So that made it simpler. But we could do the, the more complicated case here. Instead, it's going to make uh, things more complicated, but you could still do modular reduction. You do the same setup. And the same, in the end, you still have your A1 plus B1, and you can try and force it to have small sums that otherwise you get the right number of holes for B. That would still work. Uh, and so you get a small sum set hypothesis for A naught plus B naught, and now instead of using Knazer's theorem, that ends up being too weak. Knazer's theorem is just a rough approximation, and that was fine enough for the 3K minus 4 theorem, but it's not strong enough to work with all these sets here because they're, they're a little unwieldy. Right? We, we, don't, we actually have to somehow get this two-dimensional behavior. So you have to use a Kepperman structure theorem. Kepperman structure theorem says there are various things that can happen, and one of them is that things are contained in arithmetic progression modulo h, some subgroup. Now, it may not be arithmetic immediate, but you have more or less four possibilities that hold. You can show that it, one of them doesn't happen, and two of them lead to having nice bounds, contradictions. The only thing left is when a and b are both contained in short arithmetic progressions modulo some period. And you can show that that implies that they're two-dimensional. There's a short little argument, well, relatively short. We, we take a, it's a little technical thing writing down the indices. But A and B being contained inside short arithmetic progressions, module H, forces them to have an isomorphism with a two-dimensional sum set. And you can look at how many lines actually pass through it. And now you know A plus B are isomorphic to a two-dimensional sum set, and you can use the two-dimensional theory. You can use bounds like this to show that you have a large sum set unless, you know, the parameters are the right value. And there's a few other details there, but that's more or less uh, how the proof fits together. And, uh, yeah, I had at least enough time to talk about that. Uh, but it, it more or less combines what we've seen from the last lecture with uh, the stuff involving two-dimensional stuff here. And this is a fairly new result over here, so I thought I'd at least mention something that wasn't quite entirely classical, but something that's a bit more recent. Uh, that's all for today. Thank you.